everybody. You have Dan Bravado here, the president of 76 Capital Sports Advisory, and James Santoro, the chief of staff for 76 Capital. It's good, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Excited to have you guys here for our first ever edition of, uh, of the podcast, videocast. And we want to take this time to kind of chat through what we call the five biggest uh, stories in sports right now in, in these emerging ar- markets that, uh, that 76 is hyper-focused on. Uh, the first topic we want to talk about is what's going on with Epic and Apple and Google in terms of the stores and the 30% fee and Epic fighting them. So James would love to, to hear your thoughts on what's going on over there. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I think it's something that, you know, it's kind of been taking a, a long time coming, I'd say. Uh, and I think this is going to be, it's almost a landmark case of, you know, I don't even call it greed, but it's it's them saying, hey, why would I get 30% taken off of the, the, the front end of this when I can have my own Epic store and, you know, get all the profits there. So I think the way that this is handled and, and the ramifications, this will be fought for a long time. With We've seen it with microtransactions. We've seen it with loot boxes. Like this is another uh, extension of that. And uh, and again, that that payment method in, in esports and, and gaming. So it'd be really interesting to see what happens next. Yeah, I think it's super fascinating. Tim Sweeney is the founder of Epic. And so McKin, Tim, to kind of the visionary behind uh, uh, Ready Player One, who the, the creator of the the game and the book in the book and the movie. And I think from what I've seen from Tim, I mean, Tim is very much centered around building an open environment to yep. encourage developers and encourage gamers. And, and it's somewhere that he's really passionate about. And, and the Epic store, as James mentioned, is at a 12% fee, much lower than the 30% from the Apple store and the Google Play store. And so he's really fighting for that. And he just believes so vehemently that that it should be more of an open market and the creator should have the ability to build and create. And, and I think this, to your point, is a landmark case and it's something we're gonna see kind of evolve. I mean, the, the it's funny when you think about this, I was listening to a podcast and a gentleman named Matthew Ball, who's really, really brilliant on the topic, talked about how these stores are the modern mall. So where you used to go to a mall and you might go shopping for your shoes, for your shirts, for your food, whatever you may need, you're now going to these digital stores to get all that stuff. And for Apple to be taking 30% of that off the jump may seem a little bit high, especially when you have creators who are just starting up. And, you know, you talked about microtransactions, which are, you know, skins, things like that, that you can buy within an app. Um, why should they have the right to 30% of that? Maybe it's lower. Maybe it should be more. It's kind of an opinion basis. I personally yeah. kind of think it should be a little lower. Yeah, I think Epic is really standing up for all the other developers out there, publishers that that want to be able to handle this on their own. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. 100%. Stay tuned on that one. It'll be super cool to see what plays out. I think it's going to have major implications for the next 50 to 100 years. The next topic we want to talk about, I think, is one that's very important around the social justice vertical, is what's going on with the players and athletes of the leagues around the re- recent uh, shooting that we had in Wisconsin, and obviously with what happened with George Floyd in Minnesota, is the players elected not to play in the NBA playoffs. MLB teams elected not to play. Uh, NHL has since moved forward and said uh, they would be taking time off where they had not in the initial night. Uh, James, what do, you, what do you think this means? What is, what is this all about? This is something that I think it's one of the, I tweeted this out the other day that it's one of the days we'll never forget in our lives. Um, I think that we've always talked about the power of sports and what sports can do to change the world for the better. I think we saw that at the fullest extent the other night. I mean, I think what the Bucks did to start this off um, by, you know, this is a playoff game. These games, people have been waiting to see these games, been waiting to play these games for months and nobody thought they'd be able to. And now the fact that they are comfortable enough because they believe in what they believe in so much that they're willing to step away from that to make an impact on the world. It is so unbelievable. So I commend every single player, athlete, team league that has stepped up and done this because change needs to be had. These are the people that are more uh, subjected to the public public uh, world more than anybody else. So they can really make this impact better than anybody else. So um, I'm so impressed. I think it's going to be successful in the sense that change is going to be made because of what they're doing. And I think this is the only beginning. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what happens next. And I think that uh, there's a lot of change that needs to be made. I agree completely. I think it, I use this analogy quite frequently is when I was growing up, I, I was a Yankees fan and whoever wore that Yankees jersey was the most important person to me, uh, whether that be Paul and Neil, Neil, Derek Jeter, whoever it may be. But now it's about the athlete. The athlete is bigger than the jersey. And so I think these these men and women have such a massive voice and such a huge audience when you talk about influencers and the influencer market, the athletes are the influencers. You know, when LeBron says something, people listen. It's not what the Lakers say. It's not what Cleveland used to say. It's not what Miami used to say. It's what LeBron had to say. And I think that's so important. And I am so excited to see these athletes and, and 
uh, I'll call them influencers, use their platform to really share good and share their vision because I think we do have a problem in this country. And for them to speak about it publicly and be a voice that so many people are going to listen to, I think is really invaluable. And you have such diverse demographics from you know NBA to MLB to NHL that if these guys really unify and can share their vision, uh, it will hit so many people, and I really think that's an amazing thing. And, and we love seeing this kind of stuff. We want to see more. Yeah. And and Dan, one thing you did mention too about the men and women that are a part of this. I mean, the WNBA has been they spearheaded this entire thing, so they are they're doing such an unbelievable job. And it is really cool to see the way that they've stepped up and really have been the face of this movement. So commend the WNBA, and I really hope that they they get the the recognition they deserve for this because I think it's getting overshadowed. And it, I want to make sure that they're at the front of this. So. Congrats Absolutely. to that. That's awesome. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's a, it's a shame our uh, our girl Sabrina Ionesco got hurt, but I, I was super excited to see her first year, and she's going to yeah. be a player. Yeah. Um, our next topic we want to talk about is a really interesting one that's been making a ton of headlines is uh, PointsBet does a $500 million deal with NBC Sports. Really fascinating to see what comes of this. Uh, uh, I'll take the lead on this one. Uh, it's one that I'm really excited about is NBC, it, NBC Sports. We've seen similar deals with Fox. Uh, where they've done deals in the past to create Fox Bet and working with a sports betting operator. But I think what NBC is doing here with, uh, with points bets is really interesting because NBC, obviously being owned by Comcast, has a media component as well, in addition to what they've done in the past with Roto World, where they, they have experience in this space. They've created value for betters. They've provided content for betters. Uh, and I think what they're doing here with points bet is going to be really fascinating. One of the key takeaways in talking to Evan Davis, our sports betting lead, is the equity portion, is that uh, points bet and, and is giving up some of their equity to NBC as part of the deal. So it's mutually beneficial for, for the success of points bet from NBC. So as a, as a media network and a channel with so much, uh, so much reach from every, every one of their uh, different avenues, they have the benefit of growing this brand and, and not just the equity piece, but they also have an affiliate program where for every person they can sign up their points bet, they're making money on top of it. So it really is an extremely lucrative deal, and I'm very excited to see where this goes. So, James, I don't know if you have any thoughts on it as well. Yeah, I think it's indicative of the way the sports betting market's kind of moving. Uh, I think you're starting to see these different types of partnerships with media companies and sports betting brands because especially in a time where fans aren't allowed in stadiums, the best way to interact and become engaged in a game is to, to bet on that game. So I think that meshing together that media side and the betting side is, again, it makes perfect sense, and we're starting to see it come to fruition. And, again, these types of deals are only the beginning of what's about to be many, many more. I mean, I think the first one was Barstool and Penn National. We all saw the news that made and the headlines that made. So now you're starting to see the kind of the domino effects of that. And I think, again, this is still the very beginning stages of it. But media and betting, they go hand in hand. These types of partnerships go hand in hand, and it's really going to create a better future for sports betting. 100%. I totally agree. And as a sports better myself, I, I couldn't be more excited to see it play out. Well, on that topic, you mentioned fans not being in stadiums and, and games not being played. So let's transition to college sports here. I think there's a really interesting situation unfolding here with some of the conferences electing to play, some canceling their season, um, players talking about potentially playing on their own without a conference. Uh, what do you make of what's going on in college sports right now? It's a mess. It is, it is an absolute mess. And I think that one, I think it's been interesting to see the lack of preparation, which I don't blame anybody given the circumstances. Like Again, nobody could have ever expected the way this has gone, but I don't know if they're necessarily proactive in thinking about the best way to handle this. Because I think when you have all these different conferences and leagues and teams not playing certain seasons, it's a, again, the domino effect is that affects other teams and leagues because you're scheduling out of conference games, you're doing all these different things. So from an, a playing perspective, it's a mess. I mean, I saw today that the Big Ten – Apparently, one of the ADs told their players that they're playing this year. So, yeah, the Big Ten telling people they're playing. You have, you know, the SEC telling people they're playing. You have other conferences saying they're not playing. So it's just nobody knows what's going on, and there's not really any direct path to finding a common ground. So I think, like you said, Dan, I think there will be some players that want to go play on their own, and there's going to be startup leagues and an opportunity for entrepreneurs to really capitalize on this. I also think for some of these players, it's a blessing in disguise. So – I think for a lot of these guys, they have to be smart about their decisions because, hey, if you're going to go play spring football, if that's what the decision is, you're risking an injury later in your period of where you're going to get drafted. So some of these guys are better off probably sitting out. So it's the next month or two, figuring out, if, I guess, before whenever this is supposed to start is going to be insane. And I think it's going to change every day. But um, it's it really shows the ineptitude of, of and, the, and the decentralization of college sports that they can't figure this out. 
Yeah, it's been fascinating. I mean, there's been a lot of talk around the NCAA and their involvement and how they make the bulk of their money off of March Madness versus college football. So they're kind of sitting this one out and saying, you guys figured out as long as we make our money during March Madness, we're good. And uh, it, it's interesting. We've been talking to a number of agents and uh, uh, player personnel folks from professional teams. And one of the one of the one of my favorite uh, examples that I was given recently was Joe Burrow. Imagine Joe Burrow didn't get to play his last year. Where is that guy getting drafted? I mean, that guy's the first overall pick. He may be working with us. Yeah, right. He might be. He might be on our side, which I wouldn't be disappointed of. We'd be winning the uh, intramural games over here. Yeah, but it's interesting because there are folks that are going to be that are going to be hindered by this, and and whether that's a fourth or fifth round pick that had their moment, a player coming off an injury, and we're not speaking specifically about football exclusively. I mean, there's plenty of plenty of sports out there from track and 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 you know everything else, basketball. And hopefully that rolls around in, in the winter, but. It, this is impacting so many kids and so many students, and, and this is something that'll play with them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, man. I, unfortunately, I've seen it firsthand. Um, you know, having played baseball, a lot of my friends that are still playing right now, a lot of them expected to get drafted this year. A lot of them expected to not have to go and visit other schools because of that draft. Because their season got canceled this year, there's only five rounds of MLB draft. There's usually 40. So 35 rounds of 31, 32 kids getting drafted. That's, a, that's you know, it's around 1,000 kids that aren't getting drafted anymore. So you start, what is that? Quick math. I like that. LaSalle education. <laughs> um, but you, you start thinking about what those, again, again, domino effects is all the NCAA right now and current advice in general. But what happens when these other drafts get smaller? Then the player pools get smaller. They have all these different professional teams that aren't going to have players to field the teams and not going to pay their operating expenses. So there's a lot going on here. It's a lot more than just strictly watching these games on Saturdays or watching college basketball. There's a lot going on for all these schools and their livelihoods. So it's be really, really, it's, it's, it's a scary situation. It's crazy. I'm curious to see how it plays out. I'll, I'll sit back on my couch and watch it, watch it unfold from my, uh, from my ivory tower, just poking holes at everybody else's decisions. My favorite, my favorite pastime. And, and our, our last topic here is an interesting one in the esports and gaming space. This weekend is the Call of Duty League Championship. So the Call of Duty League is it's in, in, in its first year uh, as the franchise model with, with 12 franchise cities across the U.S. And, and globally. And the championship is this weekend. And we actually have a great guest on board to talk about it who we're super excited for. Uh, and so we're really excited to see how this unfolds to crown the first champion. Uh, I believe it's a one and a half million dollar first place prize. They're getting some Jordan sixes. They're getting a throne, honestly, a, a real throne. <laughs> one of the things they're getting on top of that. And so we're super excited to, to hear more about that from our guest. Yeah, uh, Jake is the man. Jake is he's the esports expert and he merges the the finance, the esports and just the the general business world uh, perfectly. So I'm excited to hear from him. And I'm very excited for the CDL because this has been the biggest week for Call of Duty. I think we all needed this, hear about the new game, kind of find out a little bit more about the, the Call of Duty playoffs, which we're about to do with Jake. And uh, it's exciting times for Call of Duty and anybody that's a Call of Duty and CDL fan. Absolutely. And without much further ado, I think of Call of Duty League, the championship is this upcoming weekend. And we have a very special guest, Jake Trobal, who is the chief analyst and assistant coach from Minnesota Rocker of the Call of Duty League. Call of Duty League is in its inaugural season, uh, and Jake was one of the first coaches signed on. We're super excited to have him. Jake comes to us as a former pro who actually went on over to Wall Street and worked for Goldman Sachs, then came back into the esports space uh, to be the assistant coach for Minnesota Rocker. Additionally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, Jake is also an alum of the lovely LaSalle University. Of course. Of course has his jerseys hung up in the backdrop, not able to move on from his illustrious past, but excited to have Jake on board and, and really, really interested in what he has to share with us. Welcome yeah, to the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan. Thanks for letting me on, James. I'm really looking forward to talking to Jake, I think the first question is, where's your LaSalle baseball jersey? <laughs> My LaSalle baseball jersey. Wow, I wish I got one. I barely got one myself when I played for four years. So yeah, I stopped. <laughs> I stopped playing baseball after my senior year of high school. But one of my roommates tried walking onto the team, and actually, I found out recently him and James had connected. It was so funny. I James was uh, him away. Yeah, yeah. Cody's, Cody's a good kid. I like him a lot, and I remember when he was trying out. He's a he's a good kid, and he's a pretty good ball player too. He's a good dude. Small world. I was texting him, yeah. catching up. He's like, actually, I reached out to James Santor at seventy six cop balls. Whoa. Small world, man. It really is. I love it, though. I mean, that's the LaSalle difference. We have, you know, 2,000 kids, and we all know each other because of it. So It's awesome. It's a beautiful thing. Well, Jake, we're pumped to have you on. 
Um, can you give our audience a little bit of background on what CDL is in a, in a simple terms and then what the heck a coach does for an esports team? Because it's a little different than what most people are used to. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so the CDL is a 12 team Call of Duty League with the best teams and players from uh, around the world. Typically, previously, um, the top 1% of the 1% were your professional Call of Duty players. They were playing under various organizations, your FaZe clans, your Optic Gamings, and traveling around the world to play in tournaments. Activision took this one step further this year by saying, look, we know that esports is the real deal now. We're going to help assist in franchising a structured league. So they created a league. Uh, they intended for it to have 12 spots, five starters to a team, and sold individual spots to the highest bidding uh, investors, right? So, for example, I'm the assistant coach and lead analyst for the Minnesota Rocker. We're backed by the Will family, who happens to be the owner of the Vikings, hence why we're domiciled in Minnesota. So that's sort of a brief background on the Call of Duty League. Then to get into my specific role, a coach in esports is much different than it is in traditional sports. I can't blow a whistle and line my guys up uh, to run suicides if they mess something up. Uh, I'm not throwing them in the weight room for extra hours. It's really sort of guidance and breaking down analytically what's going on in the game, something they may not see, uh, something I as a coach see differently along with the head coach, Brian. And in addition to that, I'm also sort of our lead analyst. So from a quantitative side, I'm breaking down what's going on on a map uh, quantitatively. I'm looking at numbers, looking at trends on specific game modes, whether it's search and destroy, hard point or domination to help fine tune our practice, to help fine tune our play style come tournament time, and really just optimize our players the best I can. So Jake, that's, that's really interesting. I think that coaching world in esports is something that not a lot of people know about. So I'm curious from the esports perspective, what are some of the analytical tools you, you use? Are they coming from the game itself? Are they from different platforms? So I think when you think about traditional sports, there's so many different data types that you can get, but esports is a little bit different. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that back end tech you use. Yeah, sure. I think the background tech you use varies by esports. So if you're playing a PC dominated esport, you're able to pull a lot of information in from the back end. Uh, a lot of it, there's a lot of uh, assistance from the developer in terms of aggregating the raw data, which the analyst can then play with. And Call of Duty in particular, what I'm working with, our developer hasn't given us the accessibility to backend information. So a lot of the uh, hard coded inputs I'm pulling in are uh, me manually finding inputs from, from in-game. So it's a lot of scrubbing data, finding it manually. I'm developing my own raw data dump and then manipulating those numbers to find outputs that I think are beneficial to the team. So uh, it's, it's super idiosyncratic. I don't think any one eSport analyst is working or using the same tools. For example, um, I'm familiar with Python, VBA, SQL. Um, I probably use SQL the most. Uh, I would say that across other eSports, like in Overwatch, a lot of people are probably grinding through Python. Um, maybe C++ even to dig some data out, but that's because they're given more uh, accessibility into the back end since they're PC games. It's super interesting, Jake. I think it, it beckons a larger question of how are you leveraging, I, I'm gonna speculate that you gotta be the first guy to go from Goldman Sachs to coaching an esports team, but maybe I'm wrong there. Where, where do you find that your uh, experience on the financial side has helped you uh, in esports gaming, which it kind of seems like that is a great example of? Yeah, totally. So uh, definitely going from a, a banking background helped me tremendously. I think, uh, one, from a work ethic perspective, I, I think uh, typically everyone has this perception that gamers are lazy, you know, um, out of shape, overweight. It's really not the case. Um, like some of these professional players have ridiculous work ethics, and I don't think the, a similar work ethic has been seen on a coaching level. Uh, it's starting to come up now, but I, I think I was definitely one of the... the forerunners to sort of push that initiative forward. So one, just being able to grind alongside the players and put in the hours they are is important. Two, uh, something I learned that was super valuable was taking a lot of information and uh, sort of putting it into explain it like on five terms for anyone. Uh, I could have this crazy good analysis, right? It, it could have all of these numbers and, and all of these trends, 
But if I can't articulate what those what that analysis means properly to uh, players who have no idea what data analytics is, I'm not doing my job properly. So one thing I learned uh, early on in banking was sort of one, how to get an accurate output and deliverable, two, how to present it in a way that's easy to understand. So I'm oftentimes making com entire PowerPoint decks uh, that would replicate uh, an investment banking pitch deck, really, that are simply breaking down how we should play specific maps, key topics, uh, key points on the map that we need work on, and putting it in a way that's just extremely, that, that basically just throwing everything into layman's terms for our guys. Yeah. That sounds like, I think, every 10 to 20-year-old kid's dream job uh, to be able to go into Call of Duty maps and go into that game as deep as you're going into it. So what advice do you have for getting into this industry now? Because I think a lot of people are interested in esports and want to find a career path in there. So what do you think, what would you say to yourself 10 years ago to get to where you are now? Yeah, totally. I would, um, I would say, look, gaming is an extremely young industry and it's not all about what's on a resume. I think some of the most successful people in my role, particularly the analyst role, uh, received offers, full-time offers from franchise teams simply by doing the data analytics and posting it on Reddit, going on the COD competitive Reddit, posting their work product and saying, look, this is what I'm capable of. This is what I'm doing. Tagging pros in various tweets of the analysis they've done. And uh, essentially what happened is, is come franchising, there was this massive capital injection from franchises where uh, it, it opened the opportunity for a lot way more roles on a coaching staff side. So now almost every team has an analyst. And a lot of these analysts simply were hired by excessively creating output after output, tagging pros in their tweets, showing their analysis, posting their analysis on Reddit for anyone to see, and really doing the free work to act as their resume, if you will. It's a lot of do it for free and, and hope that people recognize the value, sort of like DRock did with Gary Vee. That's awesome, Jake. We appreciate that insight. Question kind of speaking to some of our audience who may not be as familiar. Can you talk about like rough numbers? I don't need to know how much these guys make, but what, what are players making? What, what are, what are like, what's the future hold for this league? What are you seeing? And, and, you know, talk a little bit about CWL and the transition from um, the more franchise based to, or from, from the uh, esports orgs to the more franchise based model and city locations. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Um, so esports in general, depending on the popularity of the eSport, the viewership the title's getting, uh, those are all main drivers in salaries of players. So Call of Duty has a, has a pretty big audience, especially in the casual scene. So it kind of inflates their pro player salaries quite a bit. I'd say historically year over year, we're seeing Call of Duty pros make more and more each year uh, since yeah, competitive Call of Duty's inception. That jump, was most drastic this year when switching to franchising. So I would say the average pro player in the CD of the CWL um, a year before franchising was making close to six figures, um, or I guess maybe maybe in the 80 grand ballpark on average, right? Now it is very rare to find a starter in the COD league that is not clearing six figures. Um, it's also rare to find them on the low end of that number. I mean, we're talking almost every starter is upward of $175,000, and you see some pros making well, well beyond that. On top of that, players are given um, health benefits this year, they're given 401k match and, and some serious benefits that before they had, they did not have the luxury of having. So you're really seeing esports transition into not only a stable career, but an extremely lucrative one. That's awesome. And, and second part of the question, can you talk a little bit about the change from uh, esports orgs to the city franchise models and how that transitioned for 2020 season? Yeah, sure. So essentially, we sort of touched on previously in Call of Duty in particular, there were specific private gaming organizations that would fund teams and, and allow teams to represent them. And in return, they would pay them a, a salary or maybe just uh, send them to events to represent the organization. That completely shifted uh, once the CDL came around and now there are franchise cities. So the price tag was pretty hefty to get into the CDL. It was a $25 million minimum price tag. A typical gaming organization couldn't really, uh, on average, handle that type of cash outflow. So you saw a lot of institutional investors get into the scene, a lot of 
you know, private equity firms, some of the really big gaming organizations like your your Optics, your NRGs, your Immortals, your Misfit Gamings. Um, and it's, it's kind of created this massive capital injection that allows for a very, very stable uh, work environment that should continue to grow as Call of Duty grows. Very cool. Do you, do you feel that, you know, and when you look at the previous org, whether it was under Thieves, Optics, do you feel more at home with a Minnesota in your name and a LA and Optics name, although that's a little controversial, or a New York and the Subline's name? Do you feel like the Minnesota community has embraced you guys? I think the Minnesota community has embraced us and will continue to embrace us. We're in a very unique situation where we kind of control the Midwest market right now from a fan base perspective. There has never really been anything like this within esports. So even if there are people in the Midwest region who are LA Optic fans or Chicago Huntsman NRG fans, they oftentimes sort of gravitate toward us when their favorite team isn't playing. Um, something that our organization prides ourselves on and that our COO speaks to a good amount of time is that they've done a really good job as positioning ourselves as uh, the typical COD fans' second favorite team if they are inherently an Optic fan or a Chicago Huntsman fan. Being able to pull in that viewership and that fan base, even though we don't have that notoriety that those uh, historic organizations do is pretty impressive and something we're super grateful for. That's great. And, and Jake, a little bit in the last couple of minutes here with the with the championship weekend coming up, unfortunately, uh, much to my disappointment, as you can see with my rocker gear here, uh, we did not make it to this weekend. But do you have any picks, any thoughts on who might be able to take home the uh, championship and, and what the uh, prize pool is? I don't think most of the audience will know what it is. Yeah, so I guess we'll start with prize pool because that's the most astonishing number. There's six and a half million dollars being thrown into the CDL playoffs this year. Almost every team gets a piece of it. Obviously, as you trickle down and get closer to that number one spot, you get paid more and more. The first place team will be taking home $1.5 million for winning this year on top of a culmination of other things, a throne, shoes, a ring. But honestly, I think most people are, are most concerned with that $1.5 million paycheck. I'd be more into the um, Jordans, to be honest. I, I, beautiful. They were cool. I, I was a big fan of those. And if I had to pick a team to take it, that's tough, man. It's it's got to be Dallas or Atlanta. Um, no love for the international. No, no love for the international here. I I think they have no chance. Uh, for those, I would give them like plus four fifty since you guys are betting men. <laughs> um, I'll I'll take Dallas or I'll take Atlanta. Sorry, I'll take Atlanta. I will. Right, we'll, we'll hold you to that. They're hungry for a chip. Yeah. They have a heck of a roster, really, really good young team there, and great coach as well with Crowder. Uh, curious in the end here, what, what do you see in the esports space? What are you most excited for now that you, you know, you went from a pro, and I don't know how much you were making back then, but I can't imagine it was in the six figure range. So, what, what are you most excited for in five years, ten years down the road? I'm most excited for esports in particular to surpass some of the traditional sports. It already has in, in some viewership metrics, but I would like a world where any kid in 10 years could go to their dinner table and explain to their parents, I want to pursue a career in gaming and have it be acceptable. I think right now we're sort of getting to that point. Um, just like any traditional sport, in some cases it's a pipe dream. It really is the top 1% of the one percenters. But I'd like that to be a more socially acceptable route for children to take, for children to pursue. I think that's what I'm most looking forward to. Um, I'm also looking forward to the competition to increase. I mean, you see it year over year, competition gets harder and harder. And I can only imagine how good these esport athletes are gonna be in year 10, once the practice regiments are refined and um, everyone kind of has their footing on, on what esports is because this is only the very beginning. I think it's really interesting, especially with the CDL too, with the evolving game of Call of Duty. Call of Duty Cold War was just announced. So I'm sure next year that's gonna drive interest again and get people excited to see a new Call of Duty, see that played in a different way and the new tactics that the players play with. So For sure, really that game's gonna be awesome. awesome. Yeah, I, I, I am beyond excited. Yeah, I already pre-ordered it, so. Gotta, <laughs> Let's go. I'm yeah, very excited. And, and Jake, that was a great response to the last question. And I guess my last question for you is, what is your goal in esports? What do you wanna do long-term and, and where do you see yourself in you know five to 10 years? Yeah, sure. 
Um, so I guess my goal in esports, I'd have to take a step back and sort of walk you through my story. I've kind of told this to anyone when they ask me the question. Um, when I was 12 years old, I moved to New Jersey, didn't really know anybody, um, had no friends, uh, originally lived in Tennessee, played a lot of Call of Duty, got really, really good at it. Uh, by the time I was 15, 16, I had a well-established friend group. I really enjoyed my time in high school, but I had this uh, developed skill set of, of being a gamer. When I was 16, I went to my first tournament. Um, I actually placed pro, or not pro, but top 16 at my first event. My mom was grateful or kind enough to help fund me to get there. I also sort of pitched myself to investors when I was 15, 16 years old and, and acquired enough money to get to the event, whatever. So I placed top 16, uh, get picked up. And then from that point forward in my career, I really wasn't, uh, everything was kind of handed to me from a sponsorship perspective. I was able to travel the world. I met great friends. I competed at a really high level. Uh, I experienced things in the business world that I would have never experienced until after graduating, negotiating contracts, uh, pitching investment opportunities, going from organization to organization, making a pitch deck and really selling myself and my teammates and a product and, and envisioning myself as a, a brand ambassador. So I'm, I'm saying all of this to say that I, I never would have experienced any of this if it wasn't for esports. And I experienced it at a point in my life and a point in esports where everything was extremely um, small. It, it was nowhere near as big as it is today. And I want to be at a position in my life in five, 10 years where I can help another kid in a similar situation who is good enough and deserves the opportunity experience that getaway. I really want to help grow esports from a financial perspective. I want to help take the knowledge that I learned in my past life and, and you know, New York City with my previous history as a pro gamer with this awesome story and will to get back. I want to help grow this industry to a point where, you know, millions of kids can experience that sort of getaway that that I had through competing. So whether that's working um, and being able to deploy capital to help grow an industry I'm passionate in or help grow a particular eSport title, help fund a team, help sign new players, um, help advise on, on a game developer, help consult for a new family office that interest that is interested in getting in the space, but they don't know how, they know they wanna do eSports, but they're not sure what way to get in. Um, that's where I see my real value add and, and that's kind of the, the mark I wanna make on the space. That's a great answer, man. And I think we need to multiply you by about 100 times and have a lot more people in this industry like you because you're the type of person that's going to be successful, made this industry successful in the long term. So uh, it's it's awesome to hear what you've done so far, and we're excited to watch your future. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks, Jake. Great seeing you as always. Yep, you too. Thanks, buddy. How's it going, guys?